We see Heritage Matt Fitzpatrick to the Media Center. Uh, Matt, let's just start. First things first, you just got finished with the opening ceremony and, and firing off the cannon. I guess <laughs> what, what was that experience like compared to your expectations? Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> thank you. It was. Uh, it was good fun. Yeah, it was good fun. Like I said, though, to uh, something that I've seen uh, happen a lot. So uh, you know, being here over the years and, and seeing it from other other players. So um, yeah, it was good fun to be a part of it this time. And obviously defending your title this week, I guess, you know, knowing the affinity that you have for this place, having spent a lot of time here, especially as a kid, I guess what are some of those memories that come flooding back specifically to you know, that, that Sunday here last year? Uh, yeah, just the, the shot in the playoff, you know, the final shot to, to win. Um, that, that's the, the, the first thing that, that my mind goes back to and um, having my fiancé here, my parents here, uh, to sort of see that was... Um, you know, just made it made it extra special for a place that we've been coming for so for so long, and um, to be a winner of this event is uh, is incredible. And then just back to this week, um, coming off a of tiebreaker twenty second at, at Augusta last week, just kind of overall state of your game um, coming back to this tournament. Yeah, it's it's okay. I feel like I've uh, played much better since the players. Uh, obviously, players onwards, I've I've had some half decent results, sort of a better trend uh, for myself. I feel like in in uh, the right direction. So. Um, yeah, my, my game's there or thereabouts. So I just think it uh, needs a, a bit, bit of momentum certain certain times in the, in the tournament that uh, you know might spur me on to uh, something a bit bit greater. Awesome. All right, with that, we'll take some questions. If you could just raise your hand, we will uh, we will get a microphone over to you. Okay, Doug, right here. Matt, if I could go backwards uh, before going forward, um, I've often heard that if you took like a six handicap and had them play a, a U.S. Open course, what would they shoot? I would be curious, in, in your opinion, what someone would have done on Saturday at Augusta, someone of a, of a single-digit handicap. And I, I'm just trying to get a sense of, of explaining how you guys do it. Sat- Saturday wasn't even the hard day, Doug. I thought it was. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to discount the wind a little bit. Yeah. Friday or Saturday, um, take your pick. I, you know, I'll be honest, I, I hate those questions because it's like it could be anything, but... Um, you know, they're not breaking 90. They're just not. Because I think the way... My big thing is every single shot that I felt last week, particularly with how strong the wind was, the greens, um, it's on a knife edge. So a great example for me is 15. You know, the pins at the back, you've driven it in the fairway, you got a great chance in two, you go for it, and your ball go carries two, three yards long on the green. So it bounces on the green, but takes a big bounce, goes long, and now you've got 12, 15-yard chip. Now, for us players, we're playing away from the pin. You know, you're not playing, you're not trying to flop it because you can't. You're trying to maybe bounce it short. Um, You know, us players are kind of trying to just chip it on the green and give ourselves a 15-footer for birdie, you know, a six handicapper isn't going to be chipping it better than me or Scotty Scheffler or whoever you want, whoever you want on tour. So they're struggling to keep it on the green at that point. Um, so you've gone from potentially making a, looking like oh par five and two um, to scrambling for a bogey. So I think that's that kind of tells you a lot, and that's just one hole. And before you know it, there, there's other holes that can make it add up way more than that very quickly. So um, yeah, it's. You, you minimum minimum 90 yeah. yeah stop hey here. Matt Jeff Roberts here with WTOC out of Savannah um, because of your history in this area you, know, you don't come into these tournaments unless you have confidence to win but what is the, your ties to this place and Hilton Head and the fact that you were able to finally win it last year what does that do for you this year is there a pressure is there a looseness how does that feel no it, it feels the same as ever, any other year I think for me it just you got to go off where uh, where the current state of your game is, and um, I feel like that's it's okay. It's not it's not as good as I want it to be, but it's not as bad as I want it to be. You know, so uh, uh, bad as it could be. Um, so yeah, there's no no pressure for me this week. I'm I'm just going to go out there, enjoy it. You know, there's no cut to even worry about. Um, it's about trying to be probably aggressive for four days and and try and make as many birdies and as few bogeys as possible. So. 
Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Matt, is there is there a way for you to, like, to quantify and, to, and to, to describe to us how taxing the Masters week is? Like, they, you talked about how difficult the conditions were when you saw it and everything, and you guys come here and it's a little bit more relaxed. But can you quantify how, like, how at the end of that week, how tired you guys truly are? Yeah, definitely. I mean, more mental than physical. I mean, physically, golf uh, Augusta is very hilly, but um, I think the biggest thing for me is if you think of any hole on the PGA Tour or any golf course on the PGA Tour, you know, take take this is a great week, you know, in, in my opinion. Um, you've probably got two, three, four breather holes, that I would call them, where you kind of get on there and you're like, okay, you know, I can take a bit of a breather here. It's, it's not too difficult. Um, with Augusta, there just isn't one. You know, you, you, you can hit a shot and make a fight, make a bogey in, in like a split second without even trying. And half the time, you know, I feel like you're scrambling for a bogey um, rather than just a, an easy bogey at times. So for me, I think that's the biggest thing is that every single hole, you've, you've got to be switched on. You've got to be think about where you're hitting it. And that was kind of what I learned from the very first time I went to Augusta is that you've got to plot your way around. You, you can't short side yourself. You can't miss in the wrong spots. And, um, and that's what makes it different from everywhere else because the where, the, where they put the pins and how the golf course is set up um, sort of forces that play on you to be you know, more positional than um, a standard PGA Tour event might be. You know, four or five right of the from the right with a pin, you can go pretty much at it because it's only a bit of light rough or an easy bunker. Whereas there's not there's no gimmies at Augusta, in my opinion. Right, Kathy, could you compare Augusta National last week to your victory at the Country Club in the U.S. Open? The degree of difficulty. Uh, they're just very different, you know. They're very, very different. Um, the golf course setup is, is, you know, kind of polar opposite in a way that the country club was staggered rough. So you know, you've got fairway, you got three yards of semi rough, five yards of a little bit thicker rough, and then outside of that is, is deep stuff. But Augusta, it's basically just fairway and trees. So, um, you know, it, it's a very, very different setup. And obviously the weather sort of was di different as well. Those first two days last week was extremely windy. And we had one day of wind at the country club, but it wasn't uh, as bad as the, those first two days. So, yeah, just, just very different. Hard, hard to compare there, really. Adam? Hey, Matt, this tournament always has that rep of being after the Masters. Everybody can kind of take a breath and maybe relax a little bit more but with this becoming a signature event do you think the vibe and, and what this tournament is like is going to change uh probably yeah i think it's probably easier in a 70-man field with no cut to kind of get up for it again in my opinion certainly that's the way i feel um i feel like you know when it has a cut it's kind of a little bit more relaxed and you're like well you know tough week last week kind of coming here um i mean particularly depend on how you played the previous week as well you know i think if you've played poorly it's probably easy to to get up for a week with a cut whereas if you've you've played well it's like well you know i had a good week last week i'm playing pretty nicely i'm kind of just going to go with the flow whereas i think when it's 70 man no cut it's, it's easier to kind of continue that momentum that you may have picked up from augusta to um you know to push on and, and keep going because you know, you've got four days. That's plenty of time to, to make up any ground, on, on, you know, on any scores. So um, for me, I think it, it's probably, I, you know, I think people might be more up for it now. It's, it's like you say, it's more of a signature event. So, And from the times you visited here in your youth, what, what was the one thing you most wanted to show your fiancé when you first took her here? Uh, I mean... There's, there's loads of things really, but probably um, probably salty dog cafe is probably a good one. Um, yeah, ice cream over there is always good. But um, yeah, you know, just wandering around the uh, the harbour where the, the lighthouse is, and you know, looking in the shops, just je general stuff. Driving around, it's uh, it's just such a nice sort of quiet quiet island. So it's great. What flavour ice cream? Oh, I can't remember. Depends what's on. <laughs> 
And Matt, on those same lines, was it different coming back after being here a kid and now being the champion walking back to Hilton Head outside of golf? What was it like driving down 278 and William Hilton Parkway, coming here and appreciating Hilton Head in a different way maybe this time? You know, I mean, it, it still feels the same. It's just like a nice bonus of, of being, you know, last year's champion. So um, I think for me, I've just been looking forward to, to coming back and obviously uh, sort of looking around it feels like it's the same every year for me and, and that's what makes it such an exciting week you know we, we know what we're getting um, as a family we love being here and, and I think that's what makes it so special okay we're gonna go over here to Paul hey Matt just wondering working with Phil Kenyon he's obviously grabbed more and more players here as uh, you know he's found success with a bunch of you guys just I find it when I look at him on the green he's bouncing from player to player often throughout these days just as a player that gets to work with him what do you see from him in terms of his work ethic and his just ability to kind of jump from player to player and continue to do his work yeah you know he's the best putting coach in the world um in my in my opinion obviously I'm, I'm biased I've worked with him since I was 15 so um but uh like you say everything about it there with his with his work ethic and um and then everything that he's done for himself, his training aid business, his, uh, his online coaching, um, his coaching of the, of the players that he teaches on tour, he's, he's very forward thinking, he's very proactive, he's very good at what he does. Um, and, you know, for me, I think the good thing, the, well, I think one of the biggest things is um, I know for a fact that a certain player was being um, asked by another coach uh, recently, uh, to see if he could have a look at his putting, and uh, Phil just, you know, he just didn't didn't care because he knew that Phil was doing the best job, and and you know he, he knew what he was doing, and um, he, he's not, you know, he's not like doesn't feel threatened or anything like that, and I think that's, um, you know, that's what makes him such a good coach. He's he believes in what he does, and he works hard to to be as good as he can, and. Um, I think that's you know that's why I've always had so much faith in him over the years to you know to help me improve. People have said he's very malleable to whatever person he's working with and kind of treating each person differently. How has that kind of manifested with you in particular? Yeah, I mean, like I say, I've been with him for a long time, but I think that's the sign of any good coach. I don't think there's there's no such thing as everyone swings the one, the the one single way. So um, Again, like you, as you say, I think that's why he is such a good coach because he can he can do that with all the different players. You know, I have a different tendency to Max Homer, and Max Homer has a different tendency to Tommy Fleetwood. It's it's all very different. So, um, you know, I think the fact that he has that knowledge and he can he can do that and switch around. Okay, I'm seeing Tommy Fleetwood at nine, but then I'm seeing Matt Fitzpatrick at ten. Okay, well, I need to remember what we were doing and. I think that you know that that's impressive, and that's what makes him so successful. Right, we'll do our last two here with Ron and then Doug. Yeah, man, just wondering what your impressions are of what Scotty Scheffler's been doing these past months, maybe even years, and does it feel like the gap between him and others is widening, or or what? Yeah, I mean, he's just been annoying everyone for the last three months, hasn't he? Yeah, you know, um, he's just yeah, he's unbelievable. Um, I, I, I you know can't can't say enough of, uh, about him really of, of uh, how highly I regard him how highly I rate him as a golfer and as a person uh, I don't know Scotty super well off the golf course but um, certainly comes across you know really grounded and I think that's uh, you know made it easy for everyone to root for him and uh, I think that's you know a great sign in a, in a person and obviously when you're so successful as well it's even even extra impressive so um, yeah, I definitely, I watched like the last four or five holes of uh, his finish last week and um, the shots he hit were, were unbelievable and, um, you know, no disrespect to a regular PGA Tour event, but it could have, the way he was playing kind of just didn't phase him and it, it was if he was playing, you know, with his pals at home and I, I think that's that's the difference of where he's at compared to a lot of other guys at the minute, he's um, he's basically got the ball on a string. So um, when you when you can do that, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. Great, Doug. Matt, what's your uh, outlook on on the Olympics? I feel like you might have been reasonably close to the squad in 21. Um, 
were you? And, and is it something you look forward to? Yeah, I, w- I was. I think 20, 20 whenever it was, it w- uh, I think I was close. But with it being COVID and a lot of testing, I, I wasn't really that interested. It wasn't, you know, I didn't kind of want to see it in, in that light. So uh, this year, however, I feel is, uh, you know, is, is different. It's, it's, it's on my schedule to play. Um, I think it's one of those, you know, depending obviously in the future it might be a case of I only only do it once and go enjoy it see how it is um but yeah my, my plan is to play if I if I make the team and um you kind of just go from there it's not something that I've targeted on my calendar to that I'm desperate to to be there and, and play and play well but um you know obviously if the opportunity arises it's something that I'll go do and secondly and I don't know how much you're you're paying attention to the future of golf outside the outside the ropes but but do you have any um hope or wish for how everything um uh, comes together as it relates to the european tour well isn't rory going to live (laughs) that's what i read last night anyway who else is going um you know you've achieved something in life when you become part of the rumors you know uh, what you've done yeah yeah no there's been no rumors about me (laughs) um yeah i mean I don't know, Doug. I, you know, I, for me, it's I, I want to stay out of it. I, I don't really have any interest. To, you know, I want to play tournaments like the RBC Heritage. I want to play the Players Championship. I want to go and play BMW Wentworth. Um, that's what's important to me. That's what I want to go and do, and, and that's you know what I'll continue to do. But in terms of how it's going to get sorted, uh, I, I have no idea. You know, I I, uh, I think. You've got obviously the the player advisory board kind of doing their thing, giving their opinions. You've got Jay and and the board kind of doing their thing. But um, the only real positive sort of take I had was from speaking to uh, Andy Cohen from uh, the SSG group. And um, I felt like he made things a lot more clear to me and I felt a bit more positive and and comfortable about the future with with that partnership. Um, So that's kind of... The, you know the only thing that I've really gone off that I've you know felt felt good about um, but I just don't want to get involved in it I, I just I'm not smart enough to get involved in it for one and and two I just think what what am I going to do what's my opinion going to matter anyway so it's no point I didn't you know I didn't necessarily mean that as a, a future as it involves live I, I guess I mean you I think anyway you tend to play a lot of your uh, European tour stuff after East Lake, whether it's yeah. Italian, the yeah, yeah, World yeah. Tour, etc. Yeah. Um, is that going to stay that way? Has it always been that way since you've been over here? Or would there be any way to? Um... Yeah, I mean, obviously the schedule this year, it, it's. I think it's great. Pers- from a personal selfish standpoint, it's great because I can play over here January to August, um, and I don't have to worry about FedEx after that, you know. And then I can go and concentrate, play the events that I like in Europe, go play over there. Um, and and tick that box too. So for for me, I you know I'm, I I really like how it's looking at the minute. Um, in an ideal world, I'll be honest, I would like less. I'd like to have to play less tournaments over here. Um, not necessarily more tournaments in Europe, just less tournaments in a whole in in a general season. Um, but I certainly think it gives you the opportunity at the end of the year to go play. Um, but I do maintain that it's probably it is a lot harder for European players to to do that because it's so it's such a highly stressful season January to August. By the time you get to the end of the year, you might have played to that period. You might have played 24, and then to go and play another four or five more in Europe, it's like you're playing 29 or 28, and you're like, well, you know, that's that's a that's a lot really for for compared to maybe previous years. So. Sorry to belabor this, but do you, do you ever find yourself maybe not playing certain events here in the U.S., uh, trying to trying to pace yourself for the end of the year? Or are you full focus FedEx Cup and then see no, what you I'm, got left? I, I'm full full focus over here, yeah. You know, because that, that's – you want to be in, in events like this. You know, you want to be here. You want to be part of the um, signature events. You want to be um, playing the best the best events, the best fields. Um you know, and and there's no doubt about it. The be- the best money. You know, that's what you want to do. There's 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 no hiding that. Um, 
there's nothing that sort of entices me to go to Europe and play between January to August other than the Scottish Open. Um, I think, obviously, in an ideal world, I, I would love it if the PGA Tour went and did, you know, something a bit more in the summer, maybe June or something, go and play in, in Italy or Germany or France or wherever. That would be great. But um, I think in, in the long run, then, you know, it's if it stays like this, then obviously there's going to become a tipping point where do I really want to go and play another four or five in Europe at the end of the year because this is where I've got to concentrate? It's Yeah, I, I don't know how that's going to look. Just quickly here with Adam and Shane. Matt, do you remember when you first when you first heard about Ludwig or the first time you played with them? Any, any special memories from that? Yeah, I mean, I'd heard a little bit about him from Eduardo Molinari. Uh, he texted me a couple of days before I was going to play with him in the Canadian Open last year, and he said, you know, just let me know what you think. Um, and Ludwig played great for two days. He was really, really impressive. I think one thing that I would add uh, to that was that um, you know, uh, having spoken to kind of, I guess it was, I think Peter Hansen's helping him. He kind of, Peter asked me what he th- I thought of his game and, um, you know, Tita Green was, was fantastic, put, great putter as well. Uh, just his, his short game needed a little bit of work and, and, you know, sort of Peter said that they were working on that or whatever. But, you know, I saw, I saw him play last week, obviously, saw him plenty of shots coming down the stretch there and, um, again, just just looked unfazed and uh, just a, a very very good player. Um, hits the ball a mile, does does all the right things, and and um, again, the biggest thing for me is he's like the nicest kid in the world. You know, you got a lot of the college kids that come out and they kind of got this cockiness to them, and uh, you just got none of that. So I think that's that's really refreshing. Anything from being around him during the Ryder Cup week that impressed you? Uh, he was a lot shyer than I than I thought, you know, um, which I think I don't think is a bad thing at all. Um, he, he was um, not not quiet, but just very very reserved, and I, you know I don't think that's a bad thing. I think he's probably taken it all in. It's I remember my first Ryder Cup. It was it was all it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to take in. So, um, but yeah, I think he's he's obviously on the right track. He's he's doing everything right. So. Um, I wouldn't wouldn't be worried about him. That's for sure. Just pass it back to Shane. Thank you, Matt. Uh, pardon my voice here. Uh, I just read a report that the ratings for the Masters, the television ratings, were significantly down. Uh, that seems like it's been consistent throughout a few tournaments this year. Um, I wonder if you have any perspective or any opinion about how the ordinary fan is reacting to or feeling about everything that's happened over the last two years. Or you, you may be too far above the ordinary fan, but I, I did want to ask. Yeah, I, I'd be surprised. I, I am surprised by that. To be fair, obviously you've got everyone playing together like everyone wants, and and the viewership's down. Um, but yeah, it's bizarre. I think for me, speaking to people at home and stuff, people are fed up of hearing about the money. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, you know, he's getting paid this, he's getting paid that. Prize funds are moving to this. It's uh, you know, I can see that that gets very tiring very quickly so maybe people aren't interested um or maybe just people know scotty scheffler is just that good and it was just going to be a, a coast coasting sunday where he just cruises in and wins but um you know i i, I don't know I, I think like i say my big thing would be the money thing i think people are probably fed up of that for sure um but uh, it, it did surprise me that that it was down given um it's the masters and and you know Everyone from both tours are playing playing with each other. So, thank you, All right. Matt. Thanks for the time. Awesome. Best of luck thank this week. You.